Today is the third installment of our theme, Colonialism But Make It Sexy. Today's volume three is We'll Always Have Paris, French Imperialism Meet Cutes. We're going to explore how mainstream society met French imperialism versus how Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, and Morocco met French imperialism, and actually how their fates were intertwined because of it. I'm so excited to explore this with our two guests, Pani Narinder and Samia Sarazuki. Dr. Panavan Narinder is an associate professor of French and Italian and comparative literature at USC. His areas of expertise are post-colonial theory, film, and cultural studies, and he is the author of Phantasmic Indochina, French Colonial Ideology in Architecture, Film, and Literature. Thanks so much for joining us, Pani. Uh, pleasure to be here. Samia Arazuki has a master's in Arab studies and is a PhD candidate at UC Davis examining early modern Northwest African history. Prior to UC Davis, she worked as a journalist based in Morocco. Samia's work and commentary has appeared in various platforms, including the Washington Post, the BBC, The Guardian, and Al Jazeera. Hi, Samia. Thanks for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh my goodness, Pani and Samia, we have so much to discuss. Where do we begin? So, okay, I want to establish a baseline. Before we get into cultural representations, I want to um, establish a baseline as I did for myself and my listeners. And you can, you know, let me know if there are any corrections that need to be made and things like that. So European act, um, interactions in Vietnam were generally confined to trade and Jesuit missionaries during the 18th century. But by the mid to late 19th century, France colonized three sections of Vietnam, all of Cambodia and Laos, which became known as French Indochina. Correct? Correct. Okay, and we know that colonialism is brutal and colonized people do not like being colonized. So there were uprisings against the French. And despite assistance from the US in 1954, French Indochina, as it was called, is no more. Is that a pretty good condensed version? That's correct. Okay. And as it relates to French imperialism in Morocco, it began as part of what is known as the scramble for Africa, which was the invasion, occupation, division, and colonialization of African countries by European powers during a very short period of time between 1881 and 1914, where 10% of Africa at the beginning of that time, around 1870, was under formal European control. And then it increased to almost 90% by 1914 with only Ethiopia and Liberia remaining independent. And the Alawi dynasty is the current Moroccan royal family. And then during the late to mid 19th century, the Alawites tried to foster, tried to foster trade links, especially with European countries and the United States. And in 1859, Spain declared war on Morocco Morocco lost the war, but various European powers guaranteed Morocco could remain independent at the Conference of Madrid in 1880. But what was actually agreed upon at the conference gave France significant influence over Morocco. And then by 1912, Morocco became a French protectorate. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. And Spain also colonized parts of modern day Morocco as well. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's uh, the Sultan Mohammed V. He successfully negotiated a gradual restoration of Moroccan independence. Um, and then in 1956, France officially relinquished its protectorate on Morocco. Right. Okay. So I think this is a good place to start. So I mentioned earlier that nationalist uprisings in French Indochina, you know, happened against the French because no one wants to live under the, the foot of colonialist rule, right? So I actually think it's really interesting that the French essentially used one subjugated group against another group. So for example, like Morocco, they're like, oh, y'all are my peoples, you're a protectorate, you're better than those people in French Indochina, they're a colony. You know, you're under, you're still under my boot, let's not get it twisted, but I want you to use deadly force to get rid of those pesky Asians who are trying to get independence. I want to draw a distinction between protectorate and a colony. Um, a protectorate is granted local autonomy and some independence versus a colony. But I'm curious, and this is for either of you, how different were they really in practice? 
I mean, I think I can, with at least, there's a stark difference between the colonization of Morocco and Algeria, for example. Al Algeria was seen as an extension of France, right? And that's generally how France treated its more sort of explicit colonies. As opposed to Morocco, it was simply under the control of French colonial officials, though never seen as an extension of French territory. Um, it's somewhat of a euphemism. Perhaps Pani can explain a little bit more of the different nuances in the Asian context, but at least in North Africa, that's pretty much the main distinction. It's, are you part of France, an extension of French territory, an extension of French sovereignty, or are you simply under the tutelage of French colonial authorities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for the people of Southeast Asia, uh, whether it's a protectorate uh, uh, or a colony, it still meant colonial violence. So, in fact, there is not much, in, apart from the administrative uh, way of ruling uh, these various nations, right, that will become independent nations. Um, so... Yeah, I don't see... It's just, yeah, just semantics. Yeah, obviously, if you're a legal scholar... Right, from a legal standpoint, that, right, right. No. But the okay. way that it was in practice, okay. That's yeah. what I thought. I just wanted to make sure. And then, Samia, can you talk about your family's connection to how Morocco was used to actually quell uprisings in um, at what was known during that time as French Indochina? Sure. So my grandfather was part of a generation of not just Moroccans, but North Africans who were conscripted into the French army in a particular unit called Les Goumiers. They were used to go and suppress the nationalist struggle in Indochina. Um, part of this was this sort of colonial mentality, not exclusive to the French, the English used this as well, to divide and control. Um, so by bringing in, um, you know, colonized subjects from North Africa who were ethnically, racially, religiously distinct from those in Indochina, um, you ate, you're able to sort of prevent potential uh, solidarities that could unite and collectively overthrow the French. Um, ironically, um, that ended up not entirely being the case because at least with Les Goumiers, there were a number of Moroccans um, and North Africans in general who defected from the French and joined the armed struggle against the French. Uh, my grandfather was among those who was conscripted um, with these false promises of citizenship and a lavish pension. Um, and for someone like my grandfather who came from a very impoverished town, um, it sounded idyllic. And lo and behold, you go and you end up realizing that you're fighting for the very power that is also um, contributing to the poverty that has pushed you to these circumstances. Um, my grandfather fought for the French for quite some time in Indochina, came back to Morocco, and like the generation um, of Les Goumiers they fought, that fought with the French, um, ended up being riddled with the usual um, sort of aftermath of, uh, of warfare, PTSD, drug addiction, alcoholism, something that is not entirely unique, right, to just that generation. Um, but uh, I do know at least of many cases of Moroccans and North Africans who to this day remain in Vietnam um, and have uh, established deep-seated roots there and have become part of the communities. In other cases, um, a lot of those North African soldiers ended up marrying Vietnamese women and bringing them back with them. And so there's been a lot of sort of nuance in the ways in which that unfolded. Yeah, and if I may add, uh, there were a few, uh, it's not just the Goumier, right, from, from Morocco and uh, Algeria, uh, but the Tirailleurs Senegalais, the, uh, Senegalese uh, soldiers who, uh, some of them actually also defected uh, uh, and went uh, uh, um, and fought uh, alongside or, uh, the Viet Minh during the French Indochina War. Uh, and some have returned and same same thing as what Samia described, uh, uh, returned with Vietnamese wives and started also uh, uh, new new uh, uh, Vietnamese restaurants, right? So in some parts. So so we see how these 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 culinary practices have have disseminated across across continents. So this this is fascinating for me. It is and. Um, and Samia, you said they dangled the 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 carrot of French citizenship to your grandfather, but they never gave it to him. At best, they were given a medal of honor. It was called la Légion d'honneur, which was the highest sort of uh, national honor you could receive from the French government, just a medal and a certificate. 
Um, I think today, um, somewhere around Paris, there's a memorial for, for these soldiers who were fought, but in terms of the promise of citizenship and um, a decent pension, that was never given. Mm. So two Mondays ago, we chatted with Caitlin Folks. She conducted one of the first pieces of empirical research on historical nostalgia, and she developed the first index to measure personality traits associated with historical nostalgia. And just to differentiate for you, personal nostalgia is, you know, you having a wistful affection for something in your own past that you personally experienced, something from your childhood. Usually, she said it's usually childhood or, or adolescence. Historical nostalgia is the wistful affection for a time period that you have never personally experienced. And usually there is your, the, the person who is sort of prone to experiencing that emotion, they experience this time period through a book or through a movie. Um, and then they, they take this one piece and they decide that it is going to be emblematic of this entire time period irrespective of, you know, whatever was going on. So a good example of that would be Gone with the Wind, right? So, um, Pani, in your book, you talk about this static image of, um, like, architecture, film, and literature that perpetuates Indochina as this myth, as this erotic place where people can have exotic, I'm using quotes here, exotic adventures and and it's essentially a vestige of French colonialism and the white imagination. And we talked about this in our call, for example, the 1993 film Indochine, which is the story of a French plantation owner in the 1930s with this ruinous war with these crazy nationalists, right? <laughs> Fighting for their independence and her adopted Vietnamese daughter, Camille. Um, you know, so that's set as the backdrop. It's essentially a French gone with the wind. Can you talk a little bit about this and and what it sort of did to the the cultural memory of how people view that area? Yes, uh, it's it's a movie by Regis Varnier, uh, 1992, and we have to add the heroine, who is the plantation owner, is played by Catherine Deneuve, the uh, most one of the most important uh, uh, movie stars in France. And she has embodied, in in many ways, the, the 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 figure of the colonizer in ways that is palatable for a wide audience. Right? Mm -hmm. It's not just uh, you know she's just and she's you know in love with a, a naval officer. She has adopted a Vietnamese uh, 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 child, uh, but. It's it's the what's missing about these these mythical, phantasmatic uh, portrayal of Indochina is history. How mm -hmm. is history, history of precisely of the natives who who fought the French for we we see it obviously on the margin. I mean, we we can't claim that it it's, it doesn't appear at all. There are uh, scenes, but it's not. The most important part of that uh, uh, movie, and in fact, when I saw it in 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 Paris, uh, in a movie theater on the Champs Elysees, I never go there, but it was there. People were ooing and eyeing as if they were looking at a uh, a travel narrative. It was an amazing experience to see how how you know contemporary audiences. Uh, uh, absolutely, uh, were nostalgic of this particular period. Of, they were imprinted. A the movie imprinted them. Absolutely. So, one of the things that I have come to understand about that film is that it's it's not one of those movies that's like apologizing for, like you know how there's some movies where it's kind of like you can tell they're kind of like apologizing for colonialism. That's not Indochine. Is that? Am I reading that wrong? No, that that's very fair. I mean, it's uh, yes. I mean, it, it shows that you know the natives were taken, exploited, uh, but it's the the overall tone of the movie is is of nostalgia. What 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 you've been uh, uh, what we are discussing today also, 
Um, it's exoticizing a nation, uh, Vietnam in particular, uh, in ways that that I think uh, uh, the Vietnamese themselves would be would be quite quite uh, appalled by by the kinds of representation that appeals to a Western uh, audience. Mm. So, you know, there are many restaurants that won't survive the pandemic, but there are restaurants, many restaurants throughout the country, and I and I know even throughout Europe too that are named Indochine, and even you know. As I researched for this episode, and the more that I learned, the more bizarre it is to me that that term is 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 even still used. This or this notion of the phrase Indo chic to describe decor. Like I feel some type of way about it. I mean, you were born and raised in France. Your family's from Laos, so that's that's your word. I'm certainly not telling you how to use it, but I'm just genuinely fascinated by the fact that like. Like I understand using it within a historical context, like oh that was Indochina, blah blah blah, and, and things like that. But why is it okay to like use this word to describe anything outside the context of colonialization? It's like you know it would be like if I saw some throw pillows that were designed as Rhod Rhod Rhodesia chic, right? Like let me just constantly throw around this name when Zimbabwe was a British colony, like. <laughs> You know, like we're we're in a time that we're more conscious about how we're about nomenclature. Yes. Naming, absolutely. Um, like, is it okay to still be using this to describe things? It's to me, it's like like there's there's Vietnam, there's Cambodia, there's Laos. Like, why can't we just call things like why are we still calling it by a colonizer name? And it says it's not just it's not just restaurants. It's like if you Google, you there are pillows, there are entire sets at Target. And I'm like, is this like the more I learned about it, I'm like, this is so bizarre that this is like ubiquitous in our culture and everybody's just cool. Like, I'm so confused. Okay, this is, <laughs> these are very good points. Indochine still has currency. And I mean it by currency. It's commodified. It's, it's the uh, original Indochine restaurant in New York that opened in 1984 is closed today because of the pandemic, but it's 35 years, right? It's, it's iconic. Not sure. And, and, and most, you know, I, 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 uh, I mean, I, I, I have actually eaten there in the eighties, uh, not because I wanted to be, you know, part of the beautiful people, right. But because I wanted to know what it was like. And by the way, the food was good. Uh, so <laughs> that's important, but it it plays precisely on that exotic, nostalgic, on these nostalgic sentiments that harks back right to to a, a world that is no more. It, it, it's you know the, the the decor, the atmosphere, the colonial atmosphere, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, the potted, uh, you know, palms, the uh, rattan chairs. Uh, it's trying to recreate a world that may never have been even real, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's, that's what's so interesting about that currency, right? That commodity. And it's, it, it extends beyond restaurant. It's also a whole chain of, you know, La Maison Coloniale, the colonial house, right? Where, where uh, the, the Roche Beaubois, Company uh, uh, founded these 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 uh, you know home furnishing um, uh, store to 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 disseminate this kind of uh, um... nostalgia. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, Caitlin said that historical nostalgia is a very 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 strong marketing tool. Samia, Paul Bowles is a white American author, um, and he became one of the most prominent U.S. citizens living in Morocco. And his, his writings about Morocco were widely circulated, and it became how the West, much of the West viewed Morocco, right? Right. And his novel, The Sheltering Sky, which was published in 1949, attained cult status, and it was primarily set in Algeria, right? Um, 
In a way that Gone with the Wind and Indochine served as the cultural artifacts that create this fictitious view of a region and a time period that has endured. Would you say that Bowles' work did that? Absolutely. I mean, Paul Bowles was part of this beat generation of American writers. I mean, it was also Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, William Burroughs, Gertrude Stein, right? Um, these sort of enduring legacies of American literature, all of whom who have stepped foot you know, in some way, shape or form, or have gone through Morocco, specifically Tangier. And a lot of their writings have endured to serve as the point of reference for this imagination, this aesthetic of what Morocco is, frozen in time, uh, right? These stereotypical images of snake charmers, belly dancers, sand dunes, something that Edward Said, you know, has uh, done a lot of work in, in sort of critiquing this sort of corpus of work we call Orientalism, which spans not just from Morocco, but as far east as, uh, you know, Indochina, right? Um, for, for Morocco, or for Americans rather, Morocco was very much that window into the east, um, both because of geographic proximity, but also because of a historical ties. I mean, Morocco was the first country to recognize US independence in the 18th century. Um, so there has been an enduring relationship between the US and Morocco. And, it's for that reason that Morocco is kind of seen, it stands in as that prop for what, you know, Americans and, you know, Europeans as well perceive as being, you know, Arab or Middle Eastern or, or what have you, even though the majority of Moroccans are, are actually not Arab, they're indigenous Amazir who are indigenous to North Africa. So I'm interested because it's, it's funny and, just so I'm clear, does does Bowles have a complicated legacy? Right. So there's definitely a complicated legacy for for many people, especially especially in Morocco. I mean, in English departments and university in Morocco, Paul Bowles is still taught and read. Um, he's venerated for the sole reason that he is seen as having sort of safeguarded and transcribed uh, Moroccan cultural productions that otherwise were primarily oral, such as folk tales, folk music. Um, but in the course of transcribing those uh, pieces of Moroccan culture, he also was able to attain ownership and copyright of them, which is quite problematic. Um, the other aspect is that, uh, you know, um, I'm trying to think of uh, where I was going with this. And, and actually it's problematic because now he essentially owns the copyright to cultural stories in Morocco. Right. And it also raises the question, were these forms of cultural production ever meant for the consumption of the audience that they were geared to towards by and through the transcription and translation of Paul Bowles. There's a great writer, Mohammed Shukri, who was kind of seen as Paul Bowles' interlocutor in Morocco. And um, there are a lot of you know reasons to believe that he actually just took his work without credit. Um, so this is sort of the enduring complicated legacy. Uh, not to mention that because of Paul Bowles' widespread publication and dissemination in American uh, mainstream media, to this day, writers and travelers um, who have read him see him as sort of the imprint and see him as the model through which they can go and visit and follow his steps in Morocco. Um, and again, that's problematic. Um, his travel writings portray Moroccans in a fairly disparaging way perpetuating tropes of Moroccans as being unhygienic. But there's also something unique about Paul Bowles' writing is that he lived in Morocco in the final years of French colonialism and in the beginning years of Moroccan independence. He was there at this critical moment in Morocco and Moroccans were fighting for independence. And you could see that he had a disparaging view of the nationalist movement. He saw what Moroccans were demanding and calling for as taking away his own freedom, right? This idea of, of easily accessing drugs, for example, or even the fact that, yeah, you know, there are uh, reports that he was engaging in sexual relations with young children. This was a reality that um, is well documented among all the Beat Generation writers to this day. Um, so there's a lot of entangled problematic aspects of Paul Bowles' legacy and the Beat Generation in general. And then um, I just want to go back to something that you said. So when he transcribed those you know, Moroccan stories, he was doing that. He was essentially translating it for the Western audience, for Americans. So he essentially took your stories. And so for that reason, there are some Moroccans who are happy that he actually did that because in from their point of view, as I understand it, they, you know, they're happy that their culture was, was able to be exported in that way. Is that right? 
Right. And sort of written down in this like enduring way that, you know, historians tend to privilege written history, right? Um, but then again, as I mentioned, it raises the question, was that the intention? Um, Moroccans have had access to a written culture for centuries. Was there a reason why these folk tales and these pieces of music were never transcribed and written? That's worth interrogating. Is it something that was meant to be consumed and maintained within a certain community? Um, and is there a sort of epistemological violence of transcribing and writing these down and claiming copyright ownership? If you go now to the National Archives and look up these pieces of music or folk tales, um, it's the copyright is under Paul Bowles and that, you know, is problematic. Definitely. Um, can you talk a little bit about the myth of Tangier and what Bowles, like what his legacy has to do with that? So the myth of Tangier is sort of this elusive, you know, idea of, I wouldn't say just Tangier, but of Morocco in general. It kind of reflects a lot of what uh, Pani was talking a little about, about the legacy of the idea of Indochina. I mean, Tangier, because of its geographic location um, and because of Morocco's geographic location in general, was constantly a point of transit for uh, people going to and back and from Europe, Africa, the Americas, Asia, what have you. Um, and for the time that Paul Bowles was in Tangier, Tangier was actually an international zone, meaning that it was tariff free. Essentially, there was no one country controlling Tangier. Um, and so Tangier was kind of seen as this free and sort of a bohemian place that people can just go. And it's, it's the idea and the vision of this place without rules, without boundaries. Um, but also, again, the key thing here is stuck in time, frozen in time, um, something that, again, Edward Say writes against. And this myth of Tangier, I think, through Paul Bowles', Paul Bowles writing ended up being extended to sort of encompass this idea of what Morocco is. Um, and it, it still exists today. I mean, Morocco, for example, remains a backdrop for Hollywood production sets for any production, film production that is set in something that has to do with a desert backdrop. Um, a film that is supposed to be representing Egypt will be filmed in Morocco. A film representing uh, Yemen or Saudi Arabia or Iraq is filmed in Morocco. Um, so I would say that the myth of Tangier that has oftentimes been perpetuated through Pobol's writings has endured and continued to endure in other forms of cultural production that we see today. Movies uh, like The Gladiator, The Mummy, series like The Game of Thrones, you know, these were all filmed in Southern Morocco and we have to sort of question how and why that ended up becoming to be. And it's interesting because there's that 2015 article in the travel section of the New York Times that focuses on Morocco. And then, you know, Seth, Seth Sherwood, who's the writer, he's, you know, he's in Morocco and he actually references Paul Bowles several times. He, he doesn't, he doesn't just like cite him. He like quotes him. He's essentially saying like, I am viewing Morocco through, you know, he says the, the, the Saharan winds first blew through my life 20 years ago when I was in graduate school and they stirred from the pages of the sheltering sky. Paul Bowles' existential 1940s novel. So uh, yeah, to your point, it has um, huge, still to this day, cultural currency. There's something, Pani, that you said, um, and this is for both of you. So last week we explored the Southern hospitality myth, which we see in so many facets of, of culture from plantation weddings, even to the, you know, the notion of a Southern gentleman and what that means. See, I would love for both of you to share in some ways that I maybe have not brought up, ways where you've seen this romanticizing or exoticizing of Indochina and Morocco in popular culture in ways that have become so ubiquitous that we don't even think about it. With the, with the notion of the aesthetic and mm -hmm. aestheticization. So whether it's in furniture, whether it's in um, uh, food, what is also a privilege is that aesthetic quality, right? That that exotic papaya salad or that beautiful rattan chair where people can lounge on, right? It's like, it's a whole era of French colonial history that is aestheticized and depoliticized. Mm -hmm. And where's the history? Where's that history inscribed? No, that's obviously it's the French colonial presence where the grandeur of French civilization can be can be cultivated, right? 
Uh, so the natives are just like film extras, right? Mm -hmm. For that, for that, for that kind of construction of a myth of you know French colonialism, and it is present in every single territories that the the French colonized, whether it's in you know sub-Saharan Africa, right? We have the beautiful Malian. Uh, 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 textiles, right? We have so that's what you know. That's what can be sold to the West, and it has a lot of currency still. Yeah, and I would add the aesthetic, the commodification aspect of it resonates very much with the Moroccan example. I mean, in the same way that you can look up Moroccan plates, Moroccan fabric, Moroccan furniture, um, and. There's two things here also to add to Pani. It's one, it's reducing an entirely sort of like rich and diverse culture to one aesthetic that doesn't necessarily reflect the richness of what exists in reality. Morocco is rich in linguistic and ethnic and racial difference. Um, and this Moroccan aesthetic reduces all of that. Um, compounding it in time and space to this one particular thing that now becomes recognizable. You Google something in like a particular geometric pattern automatically signals to you, okay, Moroccan. But then the other thing this does is it also erases Moroccans, right? Um, a lot of the perpetuation of these aesthetics, um, whether in film or in literature and art, Moroccans are absent. They're not there. The film Casablanca, how many times do you see a Moroccan in it? Um, even in the travel writing piece that you referenced, Leslie, in the New York Times, how many times does the author reference encountering or speaking to Moroccans, right? It's this, again, historical nostalgia for this time period in which, you know, let's not forget that when the French colonized um, all of these countries, and again, not exclusive to the French, the English did this too, is pushing the natives out and placing the settlers in, right? Um, so this idea and yearning and longing for um, this aesthetic that is frozen in time in which the natives are absent. Yeah, and I, you know, you saying that like the idea that an entire culture is reduced to like these plates or this pattern is, it's like Indo chic, Moroccan, you know, blanket. <laughs> and this is this is supposed to be reflective of the entire, you know, country. Uh, it has, um, you know, all these cultural images that are so, so powerful. Um, you know, and people, obviously not now, but people are traveling to countries in Southeast Asia and North Africa in search for an experience, an aesthetic that is, is similar to this romanticized version. How does this affect these countries and the people there and, and really in their work to try to showcase their authenticity, pushing back on images created by the Western imagination? Like I had a conversation with Eklund Sangi. She is Kenyan. She's an emerging Kenyan filmmaker and she went to NYU. And one of the things that she, she was talking about the fact that she had done a um, project when she was in film school and her professor gave it back to her. He was like, this is this is not believable. And she's like, what are you talking about? I have people in my family that are just like this because they have this idea of what Africans are or, you know, what black Africans are. So I, I would love to know, um, you know, as we we're talking about that New York Times article about, you know, this person going to Morocco, trying to relive what's going on in, you know, in Bowles's book and, you know, people wanting to, um, you know, go to Indochine. And it's it's so interesting. Um, I, I would just love to know how how are people in these countries affected and and how are they able to like push back on these images of um, that are created by the Western imagination? Well, I can say at least with the Moroccan case, I mean, because of this, Morocco's tourism industry has blown and ballooned. Um, and it's become a major source of the country's uh, national GDP. And now obviously because of COVID times, it's taking a hit. Um, but the other thing that is actually quite interesting is that what you're seeing in, in Morocco is Moroccans sort of appropriating that appropriation of themselves in order <laughs> to make a living. So if you mm. go to Marrakesh, for example, Marrakesh is, Essentially, probably what people assume Casablanca is going to be, that's what Marrakesh is. This idea of, 
you know, literally they have snake charmers, um, belly dancers, and it's like this backdrop of the mountains, but then you can also drive a few miles in their sand dunes. Um, these lavish, like old school um, architecture with, you know, all of like the, the geometric uh, ceramic and mosaic, exactly fitting the aesthetic of like Casablanca, right? But what you see is an industry um, led and run by Moroccans who are appropriating that same sort of desire. So um, selling like cheap bags that I as a Moroccan could probably buy for like 10 bucks and then upping the price for tourists for like, you know, 50 or 60 bucks. People are making a living out of that. So in a way it's kind of, I guess you could argue is empowering and ironic, right? Um, I don't know how the situation would be in, in modern day Vietnam. And I also, what I was gonna say, Piney, before you answer, I do think that, you know, there are two ways that you can look at it. I mean, one in the way that, you know, they are not necessarily being their authentic selves, but in a way that maybe they are because they're the ones who are, they're, they're controlling that. Right. And so, I don't also want to make it seem as if that's what all Moroccans are doing, right? There is no, I a get it. growing generation of Moroccan artists who are pushing back against this. Um, and that's also worth noting, right? But in terms of sort of like the ordinary Moroccans who deal day to day with the tourism industry, um, I would say definitely that there's like a overwhelming They're giving them Disneyland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, the, the, I, I think the same is done in, in, in Vietnam. Laos and Cambodia, not Indochina. I mean, now I'm going to use the real, the names of contemporary nations, right? Nation states. <laughs> so with ecotourism. So, all right, you guys have been, you know, the West has been representing these, these plantation, right? So we're going to make you work now, right? But because people want the real experience of, you know, uh, planting uh, 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 rice, right? In the rice field, right? The paddies, right? So yeah, like, come on and plant. Exactly. And I'm, you're gonna pay so for it. Is, I think it's a very interesting <laughs> return. <laughs> so yes, I mean, I I think the the you know the inhabitants are are deploying strategies that have been used by the colonial themselves. It's like okay, see, you think it's so interesting, right? It's it's not it's not just about laboring bodies, right? It's like all right, let's let's have fun since that's what you know. Uh, uh, it's attractive to 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 foreign tourists. Then okay, let's experience this and see whether you like it. Let's have fun and make money. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Listen, we love to see it. I'm so glad that I was able to talk to you two together because your histories are so deeply intertwined. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I was just so happy that I was able to talk to both of you at the same time. So. This is my last question. As you know, the podcast is curated by the Iconoclast Dinner Experience. It's your last night on earth. Where are you eating? <laughs> oh, oh, man. How are you going to ask me about preparing us? Like, I'm a foodie. I love old, old cuisines. My whole but you can only be in hungry. one. You can only be in one city, though. So your last night on earth. I think... At the end of the day, a home cooked meal from my aunt would be what I would want. But in Morocco, in the street where my grandmother's home used to be, so there's this man who has a tiny little shop where he just fries sardines and eggplant and hot peppers and throws them in a piece of bread with some salad for five cents. And it is the most satisfying thing, but also the yummiest. And I've never been able to find it anywhere else. I tend oh. to appreciate the value of street, like cheap street food that is also really good quality. Cause I think oftentimes we place so much emphasis on these like bougie sort of like culinary experiences, but we forget that a lot of that comes from, you know, these ordinary people just trying to make a living on the streets. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm curious, what is that called with the, where you put the fried sardines and the fried eggplants on a piece of bread? Yeah, so the whole thing, I mean, it's actually the one other component I forgot is like a fried potato patty. It's called maqodan. It's actually a legacy of um, Jewish uh, refugees who fled the Iberian Peninsula in 1492 and established enduring roots in Morocco. And so they've led, left a long enduring imprint in Moroccan cuisine. So the thing is called maqodan, and you just kind of like put it all in the sandwich and go to town. 